I can address the libretto. And I can say I can address it from the perspective of uh, someone who knows a little bit about the ancient world. Uh, and, and so I, I can address the, the aspects that Aristotle would have called the, the profoundest and the most vulgar. That is, the, the words and the spectacle. But I think they're very important. Um, I, I think if Aristotle had seen a few operas, he might have changed his, his view of what we see. And this, I think, is not just uh, an aspect of the opera. It is one of the fundamental concerns of this opera in particular. The perilous gaze, we're reminded over and over again of people watching other people, people looking at other people. Um, so this theme of the gaze is, is there in our sources as well. And, and I think they are intentionally recalled. Um, but this, this topic of our sources brings me to the second thing I'd like to mention briefly. Uh, first of all, about as much as we know of the historical Salome, we, we know her role in, in the biblical story of the beheading of John the Baptist. The only other ancient author to mention Salome is the Jewish historian Josephus, who's writing about 70, well, he's writing about 95 AD, and he was involved in the events of the, the Jewish revolt in 1771 AD. Um, and Josephus tells us a great deal about Herod the Tetrarch and Herodias, and essentially confirms the picture that we have of these two. Herod as the hand-pecked husband, and Herodias as a woman who pushes her husband to do unpleasant things, things that get him into trouble. Salome is mentioned by Josephus, as I say, and um, the Salome of history, the Salome of Josephus, doesn't work with our drama. She apparently married one of her cousins. Incest was uh, by, by no means uncommon in the family of Herod the Great. So there's, there's a, a whole coterie of, of these descendants who marry one another. She marries one of her cousins and produces three children for him and apparently dies innocent in her bed. Um, we don't know. Her, her death is sufficiently undramatic not to be mentioned by Josephus. Um, so there, there's a certain unhistorical aspect to what Wilde and Strauss offer to us. But this, this leads us, as I say, to, to the other uh, aspect of the comments I'd like to make. The, the approach to the ancient texts and the problems that they posed for Wilde and for Strauss. Um, fewer for Wilde, because he wasn't constrained by any desire for historical accuracy. His, his imagination was licensed enough to, to allow all kinds of gorgeous coloring to his play. And it is remarkable in that the libretto for our opera is about two-thirds the length of a Wilde's play. And it's often suggested that this is, well, on the one hand, a uh, concession to the requirements of the music, and also the requirements of the censor. It is probably more the case, uh, I want to, to return to the censor, but it's probably more the case that Richard Strauss was a far better classicist than Oscar Wilde could ever hope to be. Um, what he removes is not just what doesn't work with the music, or can't work with the music, or what is unnecessary. What he removes is also the historically impossible, the, the points that are objectionable to the, the well-trained classicist. Um, and it has to be said, once again, uh, a 19th century German schoolboy is probably a much better classicist than I can ever hope to be. So, he, Strauss knew his audience as well as, as his ancient history, and he gets rid of the inaccurate stuff. But this is, not, this is not the end of what he gets rid of. Now, Oscar Wilde seems to have lived a life in trouble with the censor. And 
um, when when it was revealed that Strauss was working on it, when it was discovered that Strauss was working on an opera based on a wild play, well, the censors took a great deal of interest. And it should be remembered that Imperial Germany was, I suppose, to, to an extent that we don't recall because of a, a later manifestation of uh, German statism, a police state. Um, and the censor had an enormous degree of control over over what happened on the stage in Imperial Germany. And when it came to biblical subjects, a fellow whose, whose face has already appeared up here, the Kaiser himself took a great deal of interest in, in what was going on. Um, and Strauss is not unresponsive to, to the, the gaze, if you will, of the censor. But it's very interesting how he's responsive. And in the same way that Stephen suggested that we find out a good deal about turn of the century psychology and the, the opinion of, uh, of women and, and the imputation of uh, innate hysteria to them, we find out something about the scholarly culture um, of, I would suggest, the German world and the, the English-speaking world at the turn of the century as well, in regard to the, the, the dealings of producers with the censor. And I'm going to make a few generalizations, but I think they're, they're justified on the basis of, uh, of the details. On the whole, the objection in the English-speaking world to, to Salome, to, to every manifestation of the Salome story around the turn of the century, was the raciness of it, the sexual aspects of the story. Um, and, and certainly the, the authors, uh, the producers of plays, were aware of this and they were also aware that, they, that there was a prurient line behind most of the crews who were denouncing the sexual aspects. And so they, they, they played it up to appeal to them. And they used as cover for their production, the fact that this was a biblical story after all. It's in the Bible. How bad can it be? And in the English-speaking world, that flew. Um, this could be used as an excuse. It, it, could, it could get things by not only the censors, but the critics. It's a biblical story, and if it's going to be true to the Bible, it has to at least suggest these, these aspects, the sexual aspects. Now, in the German-speaking world, but, but essentially in northern Germany, and we should remember, uh, Salome was per first performed in Dresden. So in, in the heart of the old north Germany, in the heart of the old Prussia, uh, so a Protestant stronghold, uh, so to say the German-speaking world would not be quite accurate, is that the, the same reaction is not had in the same way in Vienna, for instance, in, in the, the Catholic German world. And the problem is different. The problem is different in the German world from the English-speaking world. It's not the sexual aspects of, of play or the libretto or any, any performance. This is not what is objected to, and certainly we can see this is not what is cut in order to accommodate a more rigorous censor. It's very subtle. They say, if not the dance of the seven veils that gets excluded, in, in the opera, I think uh, this is this has been played up. We we see one of the more accurate, but perhaps duller aspects of Wilde's play: the the wrangling of the Jews over religious questions. And, and Wilde even has one of his characters say, "I can't stand it." They talk about nothing else, and this makes its way into the opera but in a modified form, in a significantly modified form, but so subtle we, we might miss it. In Wilde's play, there are, in this, uh, uh, there are two Nazarenes, same as in the opera, but the two Nazarenes, the two Nazarenes who accept that Messiah has come, that the Messiah is here, disagree over the location of a miracle. 
Once has it happened here, once has it happened there. This is what's cut in Strauss's libretto. There's, there are two Nazarenes, if I'm not mistaken, but they agree as to all the locations. There's no dispute as to where the miracles of Christ take place. Because what was at issue in the English-speaking world was sex. Things haven't changed a lot much. What was at issue in the German world, especially in the, the Protestant German academy and the Protestant German uh, church-going world, which was the Protestant German world, was the authority of the Bible. Um, to have a disagreement between the Nazarenes was to suggest that at, at its very inception there was some questionable nature to the biblical record or to the sources, the personal sources of the biblical record. To exclude the disagreement was to exclude the controversy. And, and this also lets us in on the intellectual world of the turn of the century. As I say, there are different concerns. The, the concern in the English-speaking world is with sex. The concern in the German world is with textual criticism. But the concern with textual criticism is at least as intense as the concern with uh, rampant titillation on the other side of the Atlantic or the other side of the channel. And there's a certain degree of sensitivity to this. The higher criticism, which actually had its origins in England in, in the post-Reformation period, had been applied altogether too rigorously for the taste of some people to the biblical text. And it was known in the English-speaking world as German criticism. Uh, the, the German academies were, were famous for, at least in the English-speaking world, for calling into question the authority of the Bible. And this reputation was something that people in Germany, conservatives in Germany, the Kaiser amongst them, were aware of and were sensitive to. And so Strauss's responsiveness to the censor is a responsiveness to complaints about textual criticism, criticism of the biblical text. And it's sufficient grace to, to get the, the work past the watchful of the censor. I think it's very interesting how this is done. What we think might have been objectionable to the average reader, the average member of the audience, was, was not there. And we're liable to miss what, what was indeed objectionable there.